first of all, it appears we're getting closer to knowing the result of the presidential election. I know this process has caused a lot of anxiety, but this is the process. And we knew counting every vote in this unusual year would take time. And I want to be very clear. Every single legal vote should be counted and verified mail-in ballots are legal votes. I agree completely with former governor and Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge, a Republican who said, the president disrespected every single American who figured out a way to safely vote amidst the pandemic, not to mention those who are dutifully counting that vote. Absolutely shameful. I also want to note that while this is going on, we're still in the midst of a pandemic and cases are rising around the country at an alarming rate. So regardless of the outcome, it's more important than ever to stay focused on beating this virus together. And with that in mind, I want to recognize an important milestone, somewhat bittersweet. This morning, we had our 150th briefing of the combined State Emergency Operations Center and Health Operations Center. The call typically has about 125 participants from dozens of agencies, departments, and divisions across state government, with a goal of making sure we remain coordinated throughout the crisis. These are the people who continue to manage our response to this pandemic and have been doing so every single day since March. So I want to take a moment to recognize these unsung heroes who work incredibly hard often on weekends and well into the night to keep this operation running. Things like contact tracing, finding and distributing PPE, opening surge sites, setting up testing locations, managing food distribution for families in need, helping those in quarantine with housing and supplies, answering calls, providing important information to the public and the press. And the list goes on and on. Vermont would not have had the success we've had if not for our SEOC and HOC teams, and so many others across state government who have worked behind the scenes every day. So with that in mind, I want to thank each and every state employee who has been part of this collective effort. And if you have a chance, please thank them as well. As I often say, the best way to thank those on the front lines is to continue to work to suppress this virus so we keep our valuable, our vulnerable neighbors safe, protect our hospital capacity, and keep our schools and economy open. As you know, we've seen a rise in cases over the last two to three weeks. And while our positivity rate remains low and we haven't approached any of the warning flags we've set, I'm still concerned. First, we're seeing cases turn into clusters and outbreaks due to transmission at private gatherings, meaning social events with, uh, with family and friends at their homes or at neighborhood barbecues, more than at other venues like restaurants that have more rigid health and safety protocols. As you know, this type of private gathering played a key role in what was, maybe unfairly, labeled as the hockey outbreak. And we now know um, that uh, we've been able to tie a few new outbreaks that started with those family and neighborhood get-togethers and parties as well. So in a few minutes, Dr. Levine is going to share the state's new recommendations around private social gatherings. While these are not yet being issued as mandates, we strongly advise Vermonters to limit gatherings in general. And if you host them, be smart, take precautions. I, uh, I had the opportunity uh, to go to the dentist yesterday for the first time in over a year due to the canceled one appointment due to the pandemic. And I was so impressed with the safety procedures and protocols put in place when I got there. But one of the things that uh, was interesting to me was asking, they came and asked me a number of questions before I even entered the building, called in on the phone. I thought I'd list these and, uh, and thought maybe some were uh, contemplating having a social gathering at their home or having someone over might want to consider asking some of these questions as well. These are the questions. Do you have a fever or have you had a fever in the last 14 to 21 days? 
Have you had shortness of breath? Do you have a cough or any other flu-like symptoms? Have you experienced recent loss of taste or smell? Have you been in contact with anyone who has been confirmed COVID positive in the last 14 days? Have you traveled on an airplane, bus, train with people unknown to you within the last 14 days? Have you been outside of Vermont in the past two weeks? This is just food for thought. Again, uh, this is relevant to what we're facing here in this state. But if the answer to any of these was, uh, was anything but no, um, you might want to reconsider whether they should come into your home and, uh, and in fact, maybe reduce the spread. And as our travel map uh, stays almost entirely in the red, limiting travel will be crucial to slowing down our case growth. So we'll talk more about this on Tuesday. Before we get uh, to these topics, it's important to remember why suppressing this virus is so essential. So we have Dr. Bell, the president of the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics back with us today. As we said, when we reopen schools in September, keeping the level of virus low in our communities is critical uh, to keeping our schools open for in-person instruction, which must be our top priority. Dr. Bell is going to remind us why that's so important, and I really hope every Vermonter takes notice because we all have a role to play and a responsibility to our kids. By staying vigilant, being smart, limiting our gathering sizes and travel, even during the holidays, we can keep schools and our economy open. And we will get through this pandemic faster and on better footing than just about any other state. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bell. Well, thank you for having me back, Governor. I was here in July on behalf of Vermont pediatricians speaking about the importance of in-person learning for children's academic, social, and developmental needs and why we believed, given Vermont's very low prevalence rate of COVID-19 and the lower risk of transmission and serious disease among children, that in-person learning could be done safely and should be prioritized. I mentioned then that pediatricians were worried and that kids were not doing okay. It's been two months now since K through 12 schools opened and I'd like to take a moment to reflect on and to thank teachers, school nurses and administrators for their incredible work. Our pediatric patients tell us that their in-person days at school provide structure and routine and the opportunity to interact with their peers and teachers in meaningful ways. Many describe improvements in their mental health. Parents are relieved and grateful. When I asked a school leader recently how things were going at her school, she said, teachers are really showing up for kids. They have given up a level of normalcy in their own lives to keep kids safe at school. And the students feel that. Sabina Brochu is a junior at CVU and a student member of the Vermont State Board of Education. She surveyed high school students around Vermont recently about their feelings on school life during the pandemic. Over a thousand Vermont students responded across eight high schools and she shared some of that data with me. What was most striking to her was when she asked students how protected they feel from COVID-19 at school. The percentage of students who said they felt not at all or just barely protected was only 3%. The vast majority of students in Vermont feel safe at school, and this is a testament to the work of teachers, administrators, and fellow students. They've created a community of safety. And the case numbers support this feeling of safety. We have always known that there would be cases of COVID-19 in schools because schools reflect what's happening in the community. We continue to see that schools are not a main driver of transmission in this pandemic. The fact that there have been a number of cases in the K through 12 learning environment that have not led to outbreaks highlights the effectiveness of the mitigation strategies we have in place here in Vermont. As COVID-19 cases grow in communities in and around Vermont, pediatricians wanna highlight the good work that schools are doing and to implore Vermonters to follow health department guidelines around masking, distancing, avoiding crowded spaces, 
adhering to travel guidelines, getting the flu shot, and staying home when sick. As the days get darker and colder and we enter the holiday season, following the guidelines will be more important than ever in order to keep kids in school. And why is this important? It's crucial because kids need consistent in-person learning with minimal interruption. Children and adolescents exist on a different time course than adults. Growth and development is measured in weeks and months, not years. Development is rapid and exciting, but that also means that when opportunity is missed or delayed, that lost time can be unforgiving for children. We saw this in the spring when school closures led to regression of developmental milestones for our children with special health needs who missed out on much needed services. Educators have been racing against the clock too, trying to catch students up and re-engage learners who have fallen behind. These are critical times for periods, critical time periods for motor and sensory development, for social emotional learning, and for academic progress. Kids can't afford to lose more time. So what can the community do to minimize school interruption? I'm gonna speak a little bit about equity here. Although COVID-19 presents a risk to all of us, it does not do so equally. We know that there are great disparities in how the virus directly and indirectly affects our population. Knowing that the virus does discriminate, I would ask that Vermonters make decisions about their own activity through an equity lens. When the health department makes policy, it considers how the policy may affect equity. And we can do that too on an individual basis as we make decisions. As an example, holiday travel and gatherings are activities that require resources that are not available to all Vermonters. Travel requires a place to stay, a reliable form of transportation, time off from work. Hosting large groups for gatherings requires a home and space and food to share. And those Vermonters struggling with housing or food insecurity are not able to participate in these activities. COVID-19 has forced us to consider risks and benefits to everything we do. As we think about whether to participate in an activity that may increase public health risk, we should think about whether the activity minimizes or exacerbates inequities. Hosting a large gathering in your home over the holidays is not an activity available to all Vermonters and by possibly increasing the risk of COVID-19 transmission in the community, it could threaten the ability of schools to stay open, a place that does address and minimize inequity. Keeping our schools and early childhood centers open should be a priority. The other piece is getting a flu shot. As we head into our typical viral respiratory season, we worry about how influenza will affect our health, our testing resources, our hospital capacity, and our ability to keep schools open. If you haven't gotten your flu shot yet, please do so now. Every year, Vermonters become sick and some die from influenza. I personally have cared for Vermont children who have died or have had devastating complications relating to the flu. Getting an influenza vaccine can prevent illness completely or reduce the severity of illness. We're doing better than previous years to date in terms of vaccine coverage, but our baseline coverage, to be honest, is not great. Typically, Vermonters get vaccinated um, about average compared to the rest of the country, and we can do better. In particular, only 27% of Vermonters ages 18 to 49 received a flu shot last year. We're living in a time of increased awareness of how our individual behavior affects our local and national communities. Vermont broke voting records this week. Let's continue this engagement by making sure all Vermonters are vaccinated against influenza. Reducing community spread of the flu will keep us healthy, keep our children in childcare and school, and allow us to work. I wanna end my remarks by again reflecting on the incredible work that our schools have done this fall to support kids. Together with early childhood centers, after school programming, and childcare hubs, Vermont children and families are receiving much needed support. We all need to do our part and follow the health department guidelines. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Secretary French. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Dr. Bell. Uh, good morning. Our uh, schools continue to operate safely during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're not seeing large patterns among the handful of cases that we are seeing in schools, and the work of contact tracing and containment seems to be working well. Uh, as of November 1st, this past Tuesday, uh, we had 11 cases in the last seven days in schools, and a total of 39 <coughs> cases since schools opened in September. Uh, these numbers include uh, student and staff cases. School operations are being affected by the availability of staff, uh, which have caused some schools to shift back and forth between in-person instruction and remote learning. This flexibility was built into our planning, and schools are maintaining a fairly consistent operational disposition in spite of these challenges. Some of our schools on the New Hampshire border are struggling with operations as cases continue to increase on the other side of the river. We are working closely with them to provide support and guidance in cooperation with the school authorities in New Hampshire. <clears throat> it's hard to remember uh, with the weather today, but this week and this past week, we saw our first uh, accumulating snow in many parts of the state. Um, it was nice to see the pictures on social media of our students uh, playing and having fun in the snow during recess and after school. Uh, there are many pictures of students sledding, building snowmen. In short, the normal activities <clears throat> that Vermont children enjoy during the winter in any year, let alone in a year during a global pandemic. These pictures underscore how successful the work of our teachers and our schools have been. Despite this unprecedented global pandemic, our students had fun playing in the snow with their friends at school. It's important to remember that in-person instruction is much more than academics. It's about all the normal activities and routines that schools provide to ensure the healthy development of our students. I want to thank all Vermonters for their willingness to accept and follow our safety guidelines. For adults, this has been an incredibly stressful time, but by working together, we have made it a less stressful time for our kids. This is something we should all be very proud of. We need to continue to put a priority on their safety and well-being in the coming months. We can do this by working together to keep our schools open and safe. Thanksgiving and the holiday period can be a wonderful opportunity to celebrate with our families and friends, but this year will need to be different than normal. I've been asked if we will be con considering putting all schools into remote learning after Thanksgiving as part of a preemptive strategy to address potential safety, travel, and quarantine considerations. Quite simply, I feel that taking such, such action would not be in the best interest of our students. Our conditions for the virus remain positive in Vermont, and we should endeavor to keep our schools open for in-person instruction as best we can. This is what is best for our kids. We have asked a lot of our schools in the last several months, and staffing issues will continue to make it challenging for many of them to sustain in person uh, through the winter. This was expected to a certain extent, but we remain committed to providing in-person instruction for our students if we can safely do so. Yesterday, the Agency of Education shared a holiday travel toolkit for schools uh, that was developed in conjunction with the Department of Health. Um, I think it provides useful information for school personnel and all Vermonters on how to make this holiday period as safe as possible so we can keep our schools open. Firstly, we strongly advise not traveling this Thanksgiving. We think there are risks involved with hosting or participating in any gathering, and those risks need to be evaluated from a personal perspective and from the perspective of your family and friends. That being said, we understand that many of us miss our families during this time of year and look forward to celebrating the holidays together. We suggest that you start having conversations now about the risks associated with any potential holiday gathering. Our holiday travel toolkit provides the following prompts to help have these types of conversations. Uh, firstly, you should check the Vermont travel map before making your plans. The travel map's updated every Tuesday, so you need to be aware of the conditions of where you're traveling to, or in the case of your guests, the quarantine requirements they will have to meet when traveling to Vermont. You also need to consider what quarantine requirements you will need to meet upon returning to Vermont if you're traveling out of state. This brings up another point. You should have what we are calling a COVID talk in advance with the people you plan to visit and discuss your comfort with COVID-19 prevention steps like when people wear a mask, how you'll stay six feet apart, and how you can keep gathering small. Basically, you need to consider whether your trip or gathering is worth the risk to you and your family. And before you attend a gathering, make sure everyone has the same understanding of the precautions that will be necessary, such as wearing masks and distancing. Additionally, everyone should get a flu shot before Thanksgiving. 
Like we saw with high school graduations in June and recently with Halloween, Vermonters are really good at finding creative ways to celebrate, even in the middle of a pandemic. Those creative solutions can make this Thanksgiving very memorable, but we need to acknowledge that there are real risks involved with traveling and gathering during this holiday period, especially as cases continue to increase in the region and many parts of the country. I am confident that if we acknowledge these risks up front and act responsibly, we'll be able to keep our schools open through the winter for our kids. I'll now turn it uh, over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary French. I'd like to just start out by presenting some of our data slides to you this morning especially because some of them involve some of those guardrails that we frequently get asked about. Uh, I can bring alive with some numbers and graphs. So we didn't have a lot of fanfare when we crossed the 2,000 case uh, mark. Um, it's hard to believe we're actually at 2,326 cases right now. Fortunately, the death line has not changed since the end of July, um, which is wonderful. I always show this so people can get a sense of the slope of the curve. And as you can see, it's been pretty consistent, though it is slightly arching upward, as we have expected at this time of year with more indoor gatherings. You'll notice that our highest number of cases back in April was 70. Two days ago, we reached 35. Fortunately, that has come down in the last day to 24. But it's pretty obvious from the way the graph looks that as we've entered the fall, we've had a pretty consistent new normal of cases. We talk frequently about the percent positivity of our tests as a major guardrail that we're following. Keep in mind states like South Dakota are now in the 40 percent range. States like New Jersey are 6 percent. Countries in Europe have gone to very high numbers. Vermont forever has been in a very low place below 1 percent. You can see there's been some uptick in the percent positivity on this graph. In the lighter color is the testing that we're doing. So clearly we're still doing an exuberant amount of testing so that any change in the positivity rate is not because we've changed the uh, strategy of testing. But um, November 3rd, the percent positive was 0.5 percent in over a seven day average 0.64 percent. These are numbers that are a little higher than they were a month or two ago, but clearly still uh, in a comfortable range for us at this time. And then finally, we often talk about syndromic surveillance. And that means how many people in the state of Vermont are going to emergency rooms or to urgent care centers feeling terribly feeling perhaps like they have COVID. And though, you know, you can see minor fluctuations, I think you'll agree that the levels are staying very, very low, which is great. Um, and we'll need to watch that clearly as we enter flu season, where we'll have uh, an expected increase in those cases and those symptoms. But hopefully, again, because of masking, the great hope is that there may actually be less than in previous years, and we'll just have to see how that plays out. So we're following numerous outbreaks and situations at this time, more than ever before. There are approximately 11 outbreaks, including what I will call the ice sports teams outbreak in central Vermont, which is quieting down now. It's up to 116 cases, just increased a little beyond uh, the time this graph was made, including 69 cases at St. Michael's College, which is the largest 
sub-outbreak under that category. But again, pictures often tell much more than um, words, and I want you to get the impression, at least, that though we've had some peak activity on this graph, things are now quieting down, but clearly not over. And if we look at the blue, that is the initial outbreak. That ended long ago. Uh, it's the secondary and now tertiary outbreaks that we're seeing in the dark and light green colors that are going to take some time. Um, but the containment process is underway and very active, and we should remain optimistic regarding that. Our newest outbreaks include two work sites and a Chittenden County community outbreak across several households stemming from a social gathering. There are roughly 42 what we term situations currently, though a number of these are nearing resolution, which happens 28 days after the last case. These outbreaks and situations include schools and a few daycares almost none of which have had to close, all small and quite containable, but obviously very disruptive to the lives of everyone concerned each time one occurs. All attest to the fact that every teacher, staff member, student, and parent reflect their community and the fact that virus is lurking throughout the state. We're also seeing sporadic cases in long-term care facilities and senior living complexes. For a long time, we've been reporting a steady rate of just a few new cases each day. And as you've seen, the numbers have increased to double digits in most days. Often these cases are scattered throughout the state. So while in any given community, it may not seem like a lot, cumulatively, the numbers really add up. And for each individual, there are a number of cases or close contacts, too, off, too often leading to yet further spread, which in turn could lead to other outbreaks. The data and the trends of the past few weeks are sending a clear message that we need to up our game in order to protect ourselves and our communities and prevent widespread infections. You know from listening to me throughout my time as health commissioner, and especially during the seven plus months of pandemic response, that I am not prone to hyperbole and that the health department's guidance and recommendations are based on the data and the evidence-based science. I say this because I want to, what I want to tell you today and in the coming weeks, uh, I want to be heard clearly. First of all, nationally and internationally and across the U.S., we're in a new stage of the pandemic. Case numbers are up, and as winter starts to settle in, exposures and transmission will increase. Many European nations are going into lockdown again. The U.S. just had a day with 100,000 cases, only to be surpassed yesterday with 120,000. When we get concerned about the growth of virus, the so-called exponential growth, those are the kinds of numbers that should concern us. 40% of states report hospitalizations are up. Some have had to resort to shipping ill patients out of state to provide adequate care. And our region has seen major changes as well. As I mentioned on Tuesday, we are already seeing other northeastern states rolling back reopening plans imposing restrictions on activities, on travel, on uh, frequencing of restaurants and bars after certain hours. Southern New England and New Jersey are seeing percent positivity rates in the four to over 6% range. Just yesterday, Vermont had 24 cases. And while that was a refreshing drop, as I just pointed out from the previous day, our neighbor to the east, with twice the population, had 10 times this many cases. Now, we don't have a vaccine yet, and we know that COVID-19 is highly infectious and that it's extremely opportunistic. If given the chance to spread, it will. So we can't really control the nature of the virus, 
and it's time for us to focus on the things that we can control. As you've been hearing more and more, even small gatherings can have a big impact, and larger gatherings obviously can have a larger impact. In Vermont, we have seen cases as a result of such socializing. As we enter the holiday season, we all have to make very hard decisions about if and how to celebrate, just as many of us did for Halloween. For Thanksgiving and through New Year's, we have to take a hard look at whether to travel and get together with friends and family. Our plans, our choices will have an impact on the health and lives of our families, communities, and Vermont. I am strongly urging people to lay low this season and forego non-essential travel. So how then can we celebrate while staying safe? Many of us are breaking with tradition and celebrating at home this year, keeping holiday plans local and small lowers the risk of getting or spreading COVID-19. This is what my family will be doing, even though it means more time away from my new granddaughter. Remember, the more people at the table, the higher the risk. I can't emphasize this enough. We cannot know for sure each other's infection status. And that's how the virus spreads. Even though we call people trusted households and they mean no ill to us or us to them, it is very challenging in an environment where there is more virus around for people to understand what their potential infection status is at any given point in time, even if they've had a test recently. Whether it's a close family member coming from just a couple of towns over or a dear friend you see now and again, guests can bring the virus into your home without even knowing they're infected and that they are in their pre-symptomatic period. The bottom line is we strongly advise that any social gatherings you choose to have be with less than 10 people and with a very limited number of trusted households. And this applies to all gatherings, including just getting together with friends socially at home or on campus or around town. Now is the time to keep our social circles small. And for the reasons that support this, while we can find plenty of evidence around the country, we also have plenty of examples from our own contact tracing teams of events that resulted in the unwitting spread of COVID-19 here in Vermont. These include holiday parties, birthday parties, dinner parties, sleepovers, baby showers, and barbecues, to name a few. As you plan your holidays, have an open conversation about safety. Let your friends and family know that what you need to the more you stick to these, the safer everyone will be. So yes, the holidays will look different this year, and for many it will be hard. For you, for me, everyone, we all have traditions we cherish and people we love to be with, but we all share responsibility to look out for one another. I ask you all to give this serious thought and to please join me in taking some solace in knowing that by making these sacrifices and finding ways to still make the holidays special and safe, we can all look forward to being together for a better year ahead. I'll turn the question and answers over to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. All right, it is 1140. We have 25 people in the queue, really asking folks to keep to one or two questions and listen to previous questions so we're not duplicating. Start with Calvin. So, as you mentioned, we uh, heard some pretty remarkable falsehoods from the president last night. Um, are his comments hurting our democracy? You know, it certainly is inciting a lot of rhetoric. And um, there's a lot, the president enjoys a huge following. Um, they take him at his word. Um, I don't believe any of the statements he made last night are um, true. And, uh, and I do believe that it's hurting uh, our society and our ability to, to work together. Um, we'll get to the 
the bottom of this. I believe every vote should count. Uh, every uh, we've, we've taken a lot of opportunities uh, in this country uh, to allow everybody to vote, and it's worked out fairly well. It's just taking a lot of time to process uh, the ballots that are in place. So we just need to give it that time. Um, but when the results are clear, um, it's time to move forward. And uh, maybe a question for either you or Dr. Levine. Um, for the past you know, couple of months, really, we've been hearing about the risk of travel in and out of state. And I think it's on Vermonters' radars. But what about in, in other states? I guess, how are you working in, in reaching out to other governors or other health departments throughout New England um, to make sure that people are getting the message from out of state that they're not going to be coming here? Yeah, it's uh, difficult at best. I'll let Dr. Levine answer uh, as well. We, I stay in touch with the other governors. Uh, everyone is, is keenly aware of the situations they're facing in their own states. And uh, to communicate, it's difficult enough for us to communicate within our borders, much less outside our borders. So it's up to each and every one of us uh, to make this word known uh, to those who we're inviting in and uh, to make sure. But we'll be stepping up our efforts uh, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to communicate that message. And like the governor and his colleagues, I keep in touch with my colleagues, and we've been in more touch in the last couple of weeks than ever before. Um, just looking at uh, the news yesterday in New Hampshire with the number of cases, the state epidemiologist raised the issue of uh, alterations in their travel policy in response. But nothing definite, but obviously raised that as an issue. Uh, Southern New England colleagues, uh, governors are equally looking at being more restrictive to states coming into their states and vice versa. Um, I think most know that Vermont is probably the most restrictive, but as the governor pointed out, it's a little harder for them to telegraph to their population and for us to telegraph to their population uh, in a consistent way that we are very restrictive. Thank you. I'm looking at some of the new cases around the state, and um, I guess specifically Chittenden County. Do we know uh, or have a sense of how many of those would be from either UVM or just education in general? I believe we do, Dr. Levine. Yeah, so, you know, a chunk of them are from the St. Michael's College outbreak. Uh, a newer chunk of them are from the family households that I referred to with their gathering. and. Uh, UVM reported out six this week, and those still remain. They're not linked to any particular, in any particular way, uh, to the community or to each other. The reality is, in the last two days, UVM has had probably over three or potentially 4,000 negative tests. And they are continuing to test today, and even a special testing event tomorrow uh, to be absolutely sure that um, there's nothing new going on in that arena, uh, whether it be related to Halloween or not related to Halloween, just as another index of the activity around the community, making sure it's not involving the campus. Okay. And um, uh, lastly, about the, the schools, uh, Secretary French had mentioned that built into some of the planning was um, uh, plans for when teachers have to step out of school. I'm wondering if you could give a sense of how many teachers have had to employ those plans and some of what that looks like, as well as the disruption it may bring? Yeah, in terms of if you're asking how many schools, I think almost all of them are operating in some form of hybrid learning. And, and certainly, I think our policy emphasis has been on in-person for the younger students, and I, I see that as a strong trend. Um, just a reminder, we do collect monthly data on, on those trends, and we're, we're finalizing actually today uh, the data collection for the month of October, so we'll be able to provide an update statewide on that. But I think staff availability issues uh, were a concern before the, act, uh, uh, the pandemic, certainly uh, just like all labor issues in the state, um, but it certainly it's exacerbated a lot of them, and I expect it will be challenging for some districts through the winter 
uh, to maintain operations, uh, but they have that ability to flexibly kind of move back and forth, which should, should allow them to provide some measure of uh, stability. How thin are, are some of the staffing margins um, as, as we start to see? I think they're fairly, fairly slim, you know, but uh, one of the advantages, again, with the remote learning is that we can, uh, we can address the needs of students and scale a little more readily than we can in in-person. Um, but I think it, it's, it's always been kind of thin, depending on uh, the region, the state you're in, and the, the speciality, if you will, of the endorsement of the teacher. So uh, it varies greatly around the state. Um, but I know, I know districts are operating on very thin margins right now, but uh, they've also been working really hard. So I'm, I'm also not surprised by you know, people being tired and, and doing their best. Thank you. Yeah. Steve? Thank you. All right, we'll move to the phones with Joe from the Barton Chronicle. Um, hello. I have two questions, both that came from other people. One from a restaurant owner who notes that the weather is getting colder and the, um, the ability uh, to host people outdoors is uh, declining. And um, he wants to know if there is any prospect that um, the 75 person limit will be increased at any time in the foreseeable future. Um, Joe, yeah, thanks for the question. I guess it would, uh, I guess it would depend on what foreseeable future might mean. Um, certainly during these times, we're seeing the case growth, uh, case counts grow. Uh, we're seeing surrounding states. Uh, New Hampshire actually opened up some of their limitations and open up the restaurants and and uh, this morning they had over 200 cases in New Hampshire alone. So I don't know if they're tied to restaurants, but uh, again, um, they're going to have to do some reflecting on what that means to them. Uh, I don't see that we're going to open that up in the very near future, but if we get to our uh, control over the number of cases uh, that we're seeing uh, and we put get back down to some of the levels we saw earlier uh, this uh, like in the in the summer uh, then we could consider uh, opening it up a little bit more but not this not this time well, thank you um the second question and i'm not sure who will get it is um i had a chance to run into a legislature a legislator the other day and he asked me to inquire why the state does not list the number of people who currently are infected. And he suggested that it might be to make the, uh, uh, the situation look more serious than it actually is. Um, uh, I, I don't know what the question is. Yeah, you know, I'm having a little trouble understanding what the question is. We do list those positive cases that we encounter. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the legislator is getting at. I believe he was suggesting um, that the reason the number of the cases is not listed is that it's so much lower, uh, that the number of current cases is so much lower than the number of overall cases um, that the number of overall cases suggests a more serious situation than is actually the case. And I guess the question is, is he correct? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that uh, maybe that legislator uh, could uh, give us a call. They know our number and we could explain uh, to them how this is done and, uh, and try and rectify that and at least clarify it for them so that they can give the information to their constituents. I will try and convey this to the person. Thank you very much. Kat, WCAX. Hi, I had a viewer who works in a school district who had some questions that might be best directed to Secretary French. We've been talking a lot about the staffing challenges. If a school has to go to remote during a positive case, should other schools in that same district who share teachers or after school programs also go remote during contact tracing? Yeah, that kind of guidance, uh, Kat, would come specifically from the Department of Health, and it's based on a case-by-case -case analysis. So 
Uh, there's no general answer to that question. It would be based on the specific, specific circumstances and who's defined as close contact. The second question I had was, what does the Agency of Education have in place to assure schools are able to carry out the plans that they developed to reopen safely? For instance, like who's checking whether a pause system is still in place if there are fewer staff, or do we just kind of have to accept that as staffing challenges arise, some of the safety measures may not be possible? Yeah, well, to your question around safety measures, uh, they always have to be implemented, so that's sort of non-negotiable. Uh, we have districts, uh, you know, to the earlier question about staff availability, I know districts are, um, you know, have to be flexible and creative to adapt to as staff uh, are available or not. And certainly, um, you know, some of, as I've mentioned, some of the flexibility we've given them in terms of moving from remote or in person and so forth. Uh, but we, you know, our, our support is largely through our guidance, uh, was once again crafted with the help of uh, our health department and, and our infectious disease experts at UVM. And it's fairly comprehensive now, well over 40 pages. And we have regular uh, interactions with school nurses and superintendents and principals and so forth. Uh, and anything we can do uh, to help them if they have a specific situation or circumstance that needs to be addressed, we're, we try to be as responsive as possible to their needs. Okay, thank you. Well. And I don't know if Joe is still on the line, but I do just wanna share that the health department does offer in addition to total cases, the total people recovered. So presumably, if you just subtract those two numbers, you would get number of current cases, and that's published every day. Next, we have Greg, the County Courier. Good morning, Governor. Uh, congratulations on your re-election. Um, wanted to start with a quick follow-up on a question I've asked a few other times, but just wanted a, a little more specific on it. Um, been hearing for a while from a lot of different employers of the frustration that the state has not reimposed the work search requirement. Um, in short, we've gotten the response from your office that you're looking for uh, the number of employed employees, uh, the, the number of unemployed and the number of jobs to come closer together uh, in order to reinstitute that. Um, and, and this frustration, I, I think, is uh, compounded with the fact that employers are, are continuing, obviously, to pay into the trust fund while having a hard time finding employees and they're seeing unemployed providers uh, not apply. So um, more specifically, what are you looking for number-wise to reinstitute that policy? Are you looking for a one-to-one -one ratio? Uh, at what point you know, does it, it cross the threshold where you are now? where you might reinstitute that policy. Yeah, we've come a long ways, Greg, uh, from where we were to begin with. We're down, even with PUA and traditional unemployment, I believe we're around the 20,000 uh, mark uh, from a high of about 90,000. So we're, uh, we're constantly, I think, uh, people are going back to work or not searching any longer. I think there is an incentive at this point uh, because there is no additional dollars uh, to be, um, uh, to be uh, utilized uh, in the unemployment assistance by PUA. Uh, the $600 is gone, uh, the, the $300 is gone, and now the $100 uh, is uh, gone as well. So there's a bit of an incentive for some to, to look for work on their own if they can, if they can find something. We'd be happy, uh, the Labor Department isn't just uh, for the unemployed in, in, in terms of the insurance policy and, uh, and, and uh, giving benefits out. Uh, we also try and uh, link people up uh, for employment. So uh, I would advocate uh, those businesses uh, to contact uh, the Department of Labor and see if we can uh, work uh, together uh, to find them the employees they need. Uh, because that's, that's our goal. I mean, it's, our goal is to put people back to work. Uh, so I think uh, we could uh, we could assist in that way, but but again, when we get to a point, I don't know what the ratio is right now, but uh, but there is going to be a time when it's going to make sense for us to re-implement the work search requirements uh, because um, at that point there'll be enough jobs available um, versus those who are uh, unemployed. So we'll uh, we'll continue to monitor that, but I don't. You know, we're getting closer, but I don't think it's uh, we're there yet. We'll see another wave, obviously, when uh, construction uh, tapers off due to the weather 
and that will be fairly soon. So we'll, we may see a, another bump in the number of people um, going on unemployment uh, or for uh, applying for unemployment assistance. And, and perhaps you might even see a bump with uh, employers looking for workers. Uh, earlier in the week, your administration uh, announced winter guidance, uh, kind of asking that out-of-state workers don't come up to uh, ski uh, resorts to, to work like maybe some years. So you may actually see an increase in, in, um, in jobs uh, for at least local Vermonters. So I, I guess I was looking for a, for a specific ratio, but maybe maybe uh, next week you can come back with that. Yeah, I'm not sure that we have uh, one, but, uh, but certainly we'll reflect on that. Okay. Um, and uh, the one question I had for today, uh, I spoke with a pub owner earlier in the week uh, who was a little bit um, just experiencing their, express, expressing their frustration with uh, some of the restrictions from the state. And, and one of those restrictions is a ban on billiard tables in bars and pubs. Uh, and the perception that, you know, a pool table isn't any more dangerous, especially with certain restrictions like maintaining the, layer, uh, the players within one's pod, uh, than it would be to go bowling. Um, can you provide a little bit of insight on the state's view and, and why pool tables might be more restricted than, say, going bowling? And, and if the state is looking at um, re, uh, settling down any of those guidelines you know, to, to maybe allow families to, you know, go play pool together at a bar or, uh, you know, at least within somebody's pod be able to uh, socialize together. Yeah, uh, maybe Secretary Curley is on the line. She could respond. Absolutely. Um, thank you for the question. We actually have, um, we don't have a ban on, on playing pool in a, in a bar or even a billiard hall. We just require masking. Um, there is guidance on our website. I can't point you to the exact spot, but again, it's, you know, follow the health and safety guidelines, the recommendations in terms of maintaining six foot distances as much as possible, wearing masks. Um, but other than that, folks are allowed to, to play pool. All right. So the, the uh, part right. that I'm most six aware minutes. of, uh, the, the pool table is basically in its own room. Um, but they're not allowed to, you know, go play pool, have a drink, and, and stay within each other's pod. And, and I'm wondering if there can be a little more common sense to, to yeah, do that. Greg, did, did you read that? Greg, did you read the, the policy on the, on the uh, Agency of uh, Commerce and Community Development page restricting um, on, pool? Yeah, honestly, Governor, there, there's so many policies. I, I didn't specifically look out at this one. I was... I was educated by the pub owner because uh, they're the ones who specifically. Yeah, maybe uh, Greg, if you could, uh, maybe you could give us the name of the pub owner, and then we can have the Agency of Commerce and Community Development reach out to them so they can have some clarity on what they can do, and what they can't. Okay. Or we Appreciate do. Thank we you. need to move on. Ella, UVM Cynic. Hi. Thank you. So we've seen a bit of a spike in cases at UVM with seven students testing positive this week and between 30 and 50 close contacts in quarantine. Um, the provost informed the student body this morning that students who were tested on Monday or Tuesday after Halloween for their routine weekly test must be retested on Friday or Saturday. Um, this is in line with a request from the Vermont Department of Health. Um, and I'm curious what the motivation behind that request was, and if you know anything more about this spike in cases at the university. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Levine had talked uh, about that a little bit in his remarks, but maybe you could repeat that. Yeah, so I'm curious what the motivation um, for the Department of Health was behind the request to have UVM students tested early this week to get a follow-up test. Hi, this is Dr. Levine. Uh, nice to have the uh, Cynic as part of our uh, press conference today. The, um, 
You're right. Uh, there were cases reported earlier this week from UVM, um, which was, I wouldn't want to use the word spike, but it was an increase from the usual uh, disease activity. But obviously we know there are uh, well over 10,000 students, so in the bigger <coughs> picture, uh, not a huge uh, prevalence of virus on campus. Unfortunately, as we're seeing, uh, especially in the student population, it's not like it was when we were all staying indoors in March and April when people might have had two or three contacts per case. We're seeing more abundant contacts per case, which is why you're reporting on the 30 plus individuals who are now quarantined. Um, does not mean uh, that they're going to turn into cases, obviously. Uh, but it's just a reflection of the contact to case ratio. The um, abundance of caution we're operating under at this time is again just recognizing that uh, Halloween was last Saturday, that students, but also others in our population, not just to single out students, but others in our population, um, enjoy themselves on that night. And as I alluded to in my question, in my comments today, uh, even the small gatherings, never mind the more medium and large ones, can be opportunities for people to infect one another with virus unwittingly. So we just wanted to make sure, knowing that there were some new cases on campus, and knowing that the campus has done such a wonderful job to this point in time, and would love, love them to get successfully through to Thanksgiving when the semester ends, we just thought it would be an opportunity to make sure that on, on or close to the seventh day after the uh, Halloween events that might have occurred that students had the opportunity to be retested. So those who would have gotten tested early in the week this week, um, rather than have them wait till the next week, we wanted to see uh, them have an opportunity to be tested today and tomorrow because uh, the timing is so much better uh, if they were going to be in an asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic state, uh, not knowing that they may have acquired the virus and we would identify it then and be able to do the containment that's been so successful everywhere to date. Is that clear? Yes, thank you so much. Um, is there any more information that the state can provide about this um, uptick in cases at UVM this week? Uh, oh, about the cases themselves? Uh, only um, that, that yeah, if they're, there's, they're, they're not related uh, to one another. Uh, several have no idea how they would have even come in contact with virus, which unfortunately is, is true now in society. Uh, other than that, I can't really give any specifics uh, to the cases. Um, there's certainly, they were way too early to represent any uh, reflection on Halloween. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, congratulations on re-election. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, you often use some vague phrases that probably don't mean a lot to most Vermonters. Today you mentioned there were a quote chunk of cases and also mentioned like 42 situations. What do you mean by 42 situations? Can you be specific to tell Vermonters what you really mean? Absolutely. Those are sometimes individual, sometimes small numbers of cases. They don't qualify for the epidemiologic definition of, 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 of an uh, outbreak. And they are across every sector you can imagine, whether it's the education sector, college versus K through 12, whether it's in the daycare sector, whether it's in the long-term care and senior living sector, whether it's across work sites. Um, it, it's really reflective of our society, if you will. So um, these are just very small numbers of cases, but they obviously necessitate a containment approach where once we know the test is positive, we interview, contact trace, make sure we've uh, identified those who are, were close contacts so they can be quarantined, and then move on. 
So um, it's just our way of letting you know that there's a lot going on at any point in time, uh, but they, none of these qualify for a true outbreak like we're seeing with the ice team sports in St. Michael's College. How, how, does, how does the situation differ from uh, say cases, uh, uh, what's the difference between saying 42 cases or 42 situations? Oh, okay, so um, these situations generally involve more than one positive test most of the time. Okay. But there are times and, that, uh, you know, there are, t there are times that one positive test has such big implications, say it was a member of a school community um, so that obviously is going to involve a lot of investigation because of the necessity to keep the entire school safe. So that will be listed as a situation where if uh, an individual person just happened to become a positive case and they had no contacts or nothing else going on, that would not be uh, recognized in the same way. And follow up to that, what, what are the latest Vermont schools that have positive cases, and what can you tell us about the North Carroll school case? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a list of schools with me at this time, so we, we can uh, get back to you. We, we will have the website updated uh, for Tuesday's press conference, and going into the future, we will have it updated actually Tuesdays and Friday. We couldn't accomplish that for today. Um, because it takes a lot of work to verify everything and make sure we're providing accurate information. But it will be every Tuesday and Friday uh, so that when we're talking at this press conference, we'll be able to give you the uh, data as recent as we have it. All right, we're going to move now to Lisa. And what, and what the North Carroll School, what happened there? Uh, I, I, I don't have that on the tip of my fingers, so I'll have to get back to you with that. All right, moving okay, to, thank you very much. Moving to Lisa at the AP. Hi, thank you. Um, Governor, I have a question about the UVM Health Network. Um, you ordered the Vermont National Guard cyber team to help in the response to the cyber attack. Um, do you feel like uh, UVM, the health network, should or could have done more to protect itself from the type of cyber attack? Yeah, you know, we have uh, cyber attacks almost every single day uh, within state government throughout uh, the economy, throughout the nation. Um, this is becoming more prevalent. I think, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see in the end, but from my standpoint, uh, it appears that they've done everything right. Uh, it was just one of those uh, almost fluke things uh, that happened, but, but they'll, uh, they'll come to some conclusion and be able to report on that. Um, but again, from, our, from what my understanding, uh, they've done they've done a lot of good work along the way to keep everybody protected, and and they kept all the uh, individual uh, cases, I believe, uh, protected uh, identities and so forth. So, I think uh, so far so good. Okay, thank you. All right, Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, Governor, what do you make of the uh, election results in Vermont, where President overwhelmingly voted for the view. They also overwhelmingly voted for Vice President Biden and Senator Peter Wilson for the House. Uh, seems like they voted for Republican and Democrat both very strongly in certain races. Yeah, I mean, it was, a, from my standpoint, a, a positive sign uh, that uh, it's not all about, all about the, the letter beside your name. It's about the individual and what they bring to the table. So I think uh, this is, uh, I guess, heartening in a lot of respects if we could break down these barriers and just and just listen to people and do our jobs and do them to the best of our ability, um, maybe we'll see more of this in the future. Less polarization. And did you receive any feedback from any other governor, anybody from your own political party here, or even the Trump administration for who you decided to vote for Tuesday? I did not. Thank you. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Um, I think this is for Commissioner Shirley. Um, on Wednesday, the Chester Select Board got some eye-popping numbers that the state proposes to charge 
local police agencies to dispatch their 911 calls, and that included a schedule of charges for the next four years, rising to $59,000 a year for Chester and almost $58,000 for Windfall. By comparison, the Chester Fire Department pays $18,000 for regional dispatching. We're, one, we're hearing that this is an effort to push small police departments to find other dispatching, and we're wondering how this will affect coordination among all enforcement agencies in emergencies, and I've got a follow-up. Good morning, uh, thanks for the question. This is a piece of a modernization strategy that we rolled out in January in response to uh, a variety of reports and surveys and white papers and things that have been uh, created over the course of literally the last five decades. Um, this has been a, an ongoing challenge to try to create a, uh, a level landscape uh, primarily for taxpayers who in some instances are paying for dispatch services twice, uh, once for their local agency and then once a statewide contribution uh, to the two uh, public safety answering points that the state police operate. Um, and not to get too far into the weeds, but um, this is not at all, there's no background effort to do anything other than to level um, the economic playing field. Uh, we're certainly very happy dispatching for the over 100 agencies that uh, get services from the state police PFAPs right now. Um, but the, the playing field uh, relative to how we pay for public safety services uh, isn't level. Also important to note that uh, in that modernization strategy, there is an array of things that we're proposing doing at no charge to municipalities to support public safety services. This just happens to be a one-off where, because of the, the nature of the way things are paid for, there's, uh, there's a disparity going on. So it's a piece of a much larger construct about actually providing better supports to public safety operations uh, statewide. Well, that, that's actually what I was wondering, because this would mean uh, paying twice, in a sense. Uh, has anybody quantified what the state police would have to spend to cover those towns where taxpayers have taken on paying for their own law enforcement? And if this new expense pushes select boards to reduce size of their forces, what effect would that have on public safety? Uh, I, we haven't quantified what it would take for the statewide dispatch centers to take on uh, additional services for the roughly 50% of agencies that don't get their services for the state, uh, in part because uh, the quality of the regional uh, communication centers and the local communication centers statewide is excellent and that redundancy actually creates stability in the way that those services are delivered so I don't think we would recommend going to a, a, a smaller number uh, of public safety answering points uh, and I think I lost the second piece of your question. Yeah, I, I was more asking about uh, taxpayers in uh, these hundred areas uh, with agencies are paying for uh, law enforcement while taxpayers in other areas are not paying for uh, being covered by the state police. So there's a, there's a, there. I'm just wondering if, if that, it's ever quantified how much the state is saving by towns like Chester and Wynn while providing their own law enforcement. We've not quantified that, although I, I think the premise of your question has a bit of a flaw in it. Uh, they're, the, the agencies that are getting the staff services now, they're taxpayers in some instances are paying uh, the taxpayers that are paying for dispatch services through other PFAPs or have their own services are paying to subsidize the hundred or so agencies that get their state services. So there's an inversion uh, to, to what you're describing. Uh, and there's a much longer conversation around the delivery of public safety uh, assets and, and services statewide that um, is a thread we could pull on for a couple of hours uh, around what towns decide uh, to pay for in terms of their police fire or rescue coverage. Some provide their own, they choose to make uh, a robust investment in their own services. Others partner with other municipalities and still others choose to get their uh, services in particular from law enforcement as you observe from the state police. But that is just a base level of service while others are making conscious decisions to upgrade their services. All right, we've got to move to our next caller, Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Governor, lawmakers have come under the impression um, that Walmart will not be applying for hazard pay grants on behalf of its workers. Um, I'm wondering if you've had any conversations or anybody from your team has had conversations uh, with Walmart um, and whether or not uh, you can give us an update on what they intend to do as it relates to the hazard pay program. Uh, 
Yeah, to, to be honest with you, uh, Peter, from my standpoint, uh, I just learned about it from a tweet last night. So I have not uh, had any interaction with the uh, legislators at this point, but there may be somebody up from the administration who has, and I would maybe uh, inquire. Secretary. Peter, if you, uh, if you want to connect with Commissioner Pichek, he has been communicating with both legislators and retailers um, where this, this might be an issue. So he'll have more information for you. I'll reach out. All right, I'll reach out to Mike. Um, another question for Commissioner Harrington. Um, Commissioner Harrington, you heard from somebody uh, who received notice that they had uh, gotten overpaid for their unemployment benefits and were told they were going to have to uh, pay the state back um, money they weren't supposed to have gotten. I'm wondering how many Vermonters received similar correspondences from the Department of Labor um, and how aggressively you're going to be seeking those repayments. Thank you, Peter, um, and thanks for the question. So it's a, it's a, a situation that occurs even outside of the pandemic, certainly with a high number of filings, um, you know, it's occurring more frequently. Um, I don't have a number and, and our system doesn't provide necessarily an aggregated number, but I can tell you the, the type of situation uh, that we run into, um, it, it can happen a number of different ways. It could be that someone was filing and when the department became aware of more information regarding their claim, uh, we found that maybe the information they provided was incorrect uh, and that changed the status of their claim. It could be that they filed under one program and as federal guidance changed, um, they were made eligible for another program. So under the federal guidance, um, they have to be placed in overpayment for the federal money they received. Um, and so we are able to and working to do offsets between programs, but it still counts as an overpayment. Um, so sometimes it's around eligibility criteria and not meeting eligibility criteria. Sometimes it's about fraudulent information that's provided. Sometimes it's around um, changing federal guidance um, that has occurred. And sometimes it's just a truing up of the various programs. Remember prior to the, to COVID-19, we operated one unemployment program, uh, and now we are operating anywhere from um, four to five programs if you count the LWA program as well. All of those um, uh, have uh, opportunities for someone to be placed in overpayment. Um, it is a federal requirement that if someone is improperly paid benefits, um, that they pay back the programs they were improperly paid out of. Um, and it, it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's not like we send out a mass email the other day and notify, you know, um, a large group of people that they were all in overpayment. Um, this happens on a daily basis uh, and occurs on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the specifics of each case. So there's no opportunity for the state to forgive those debts, for lack of a better word, um, notwithstanding sort of the bleakness of the employment landscape that some of these folks still face? So we, we do have some flexibility, um, but the flexibility only resides to the state unemployment trust fund, so only funds that came out of the trust fund, and it only extends in cases where um, it may be uh, based on a department error. Um, so if someone provided inaccurate information or falsified information, um, that then we do not have the ability to forgive that. If it was something that occurred due to the, something the department did, and it was in the, the traditional UI program, there are some flexibilities built in there. It's not a blanket waiver. Um, but under the federal programs, if they've received um, benefits uh, and then were deemed after the fact to be ineligible for those benefits for whatever reason, um, they are required under federal law to pay back the program those funds came out of. Sorry to take up so much time, and thank you all. Thank you. Stewart, NBC5. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Governor, um, have you spoken yet uh, with Molly Gray and uh, 
Do you think the departure of so many state house leaders uh, and the modest pickups by the Republicans uh, could change the legislation that passes next year? Uh, I have spoken to Molly Gray, um, and in terms of the leadership, it is quite ironic in some respects. I look back four years ago when I came into office as governor, a uh, new speaker, new pro tem, new lieutenant governor, and uh, today uh, I'm the only person standing uh, out of that uh, of that group. So it is. Um, it's going to be a, a you know a clean slate where we'll start over as we do every legislative session, um, but this year will be unique again uh, that there will be so many in leadership uh, that may not be returning. Now I will say I'm not sure about. I know that the speaker has requested a a recount, so we'll have to wait until the results there to determine uh, whether she'll be back or not. But uh, but at this time it doesn't appear uh, she was successful. So again this is a. Uh, interesting times uh, and and then we'll see what happens you know my um, my goal always is to uh, present a, a budget and, and present uh, different uh, ideas uh, to the legislature uh, to bolster the economy make Vermont more affordable protect the most vulnerable as we've done over the last four years and I'm hopeful uh, that we'll be able to present uh, ideas to them and work together uh, so that we provide for Vermonters um, second question, uh, I guess a month or so ago, you said you couldn't see reimposing widespread restrictions uh, on our state. And I'm just wondering, in light of the spike in active cases that we're now uh, obviously seeing, if that is still the case, uh, that that is just really not a likelihood or even much of a possibility. You know, it's always a possibility, but from my standpoint, uh, we've learned a lot over the last eight months, and uh, we've done things differently. We've we've been able to do things more strategically. Uh, and Vermonters have done a great great job in trying to uh, protect themselves and protect others. Uh, I think what we need to do is tighten up a bit, uh, and you know we've become a, a little bit lax in all areas. And from what we're seeing around us, uh, that's what gives me the greatest concern uh, when I look at New Hampshire and the number of cases uh, that have grown there and not just in the southern parts of New Hampshire uh, but also in the uh, in the northern part uh, and what I see in uh, Maine as well and New York and Massachusetts uh, so uh, we're still okay we're in good shape there's no reason to panic uh, but there is this is a time uh, to reflect on what we're doing because you know as I've said so many times this is literally in our hands. We can control this individually if we uh, if we just follow the simple guidelines we have in place. And uh, the travel uh, portion, which we'll outline on Tuesday, we'll know a little bit more when we uh, Commissioner Pichek uh, presents the modeling. Uh, but it doesn't appear to be getting any better, and that's our greatest risk at this point, from my standpoint. Um, but um, but again, I I don't see us rolling back to where we were in the beginning uh, because we have a little bit better understanding of what this virus does and how to protect ourselves. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hello, thank you for taking my call. I believe my question is for Dr. Levine. When the state goes about contact tracing for a positive case, is the person who is positive required or mandated participate in contact tracing, or is it optional? I'm not aware of any specific law that requires anybody to uh, do that. I am aware that I have uh, reports from numerous places around the country where their rate of success in doing contact tracing is literally 20 or 30 percent because they've not been able to enlist the cooperation of those who they try to connect with who are positive. And then they're not able to always, once they do that, they're not always able to connect with the contacts. Uh, that, that's a vastly different experience than we've had in Vermont. Um, and we've had a wonderful success rate. 
So we don't view it as a problem here that would require anything more stringent uh, applied to it. I think Vermonters uh, understand protecting Vermonters. Thank you. And then a very specific follow-up. I've received reports of a small cluster of cases in Wakefield, and the town-by-town -town map doesn't reflect any change. I'm wondering what time of the day it, on Friday is that town-by-town -town map updated? Yeah, so the update that's put on the website is usually in the early afternoon. So I'm assuming that that is updated at the same time. We'll, uh, we'll connect with you, Lisa, to be more specific about that. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, uh, Governor, uh, here in Southern Vermont, we have bordered by three states, and thinking about what the, um, what the you and um, Secretary French and um, Dr. Levine were talking about as far as travel, um, early on in this pandemic, there was direct um, in-person surveillance of, um, of state lines. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, given your concerns about, um, about how ch holiday travel might um, what that might do as far as uh, the cases here in Vermont, whether uh, the in-person surveillance is something that you would reconsider. And I guess that also, you know, if, if there's an opportunity there to say whether you thought it worked in the first place or if it simply was more of a deterrent. Yeah, we're considering um, doing whatever we can to make sure that we communicate directly to those coming into the state uh, because that's our weakest link in some respects the travel from other states. Our, we can control somewhat what's happening here uh, in the state, uh, but, um, but again, as we see the cases rise outside our borders and then uh, with the ability for them to come into the state, uh, that, uh, that does give me concern. So we will be talking uh, more on Tuesday if we continue to see if the modeling does uh, reflect what I think it's going to you know, show in, in some respects. We'll, uh, We'll be implementing whatever policies we need to uh, to, pri to provide uh, for that communication to those visitors coming into the state. You know, if they come into the state right now, it appears uh, most of it's red uh, within at least a couple of hour drive uh, from us. And um, so if that's the case, you should be quarantining if you come into the state. Okay, um, one quick follow-up question, uh, also with, with regard to concern about what might happen around the holidays. Um, is uh, the state's planning in regards to, I mean, even if everyone does everything right and travels, I mean, as, as we've learned, the virus simply doesn't care. Uh, so uh, is the state planning for the likelihood of an increase in cases um, around or immediately after the Thanksgiving holiday? I think our, our modeling had showed shown that um, we did expect uh, to see this uptick that we're experiencing right now. And uh, so we're always prepared for that and we'll do everything we can uh, to mitigate that uh, to the best of our ability. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And Wallace Allen, VT Digger. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're up. Do you have a question? Oh, sorry about that. Having technical difficulties here. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask: with historic voter turnout in this election, do you think the state should permanently adopt the practice of mailing every active voter a ballot moving forward? Um, interesting question, and uh, we'll be able to reflect on that after you know the the. The elections are all certified and so forth. But, but I will say this, uh, and this is something we put forward for the legislature to consider. It didn't, uh, they didn't look favorably on it. Uh, but I believe this, uh, this crisis is going to be with us at least for the next three or four months, uh, so well into, into March. Uh, and I would say that we should prepare for some sort of mail-in ballot procedure for town meeting uh, so that people can 
um, exercise their right to vote uh, in a safe manner and that everyone has an opportunity to do so. We've had very low uh, um, voter turnout uh, for town meeting and that this may be a way to bolster that if we, uh, if we had this much participation in this general election. Um, possibly this could work for uh, town meeting a day and, and some of the municipal votes and school uh, votes as well. So we advocated for that. Uh, they didn't uh, they didn't take us up on that uh, at uh, during the last session, uh, but we'll come forward with another another try uh, early in January. Uh, even apart from COVID, would you do you see this as a as a method that the state could use just going forward? Well, again, um, if we can, you know, we'll reflect on what happened in this general election. If we can move forward and, and try it in the in the uh, uh, on town meeting day. Um, that will tell us a lot uh, as to whether we can uh, pursue this further. But uh, but so far, so good. Um, thank you. And I just have a quick question for Dr. Levine. I hope that this hasn't been clearly answered. I'm just wondering how many student and staff cases UVM has reported to the Department of Health this week. I think it has been answered, but Dr. Levine. Did you say how many UVM cases? Student and staff cases. Now, I'm aware of. At UVM. Now, I'm aware of six cases. So those aren't all students? I'm aware of six student cases. Not aware of any others. All right. Thank you so much. Annika, Times Argus. Thank you for this opportunity, Governor Scott. Um, I'm here as a Montpelier High School student, and as been to the uncertainty of flu season as well as holiday travel, what is your message to teenagers across the state? Um, I, I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer part of that, but from my perspective, um, you know, just just be careful. Um, know what you're dealing with. Know your surroundings. Uh, be aware that this uh, this. Uh, Coronavirus uh, it doesn't care how old you are; it can affect infect anyone. Um, so your actions, uh, you should be careful. You should mask up. You should socially and physically distance yourselves. Wash your hands a lot. And uh, and if you uh, if you don't feel well, don't come in contact with others. So it's the same message as everyone else. Uh, but I hope um, I hope uh, you can you can promote that as well because it's uh, it's something that's really. Uh, needed and necessary uh, for all of us to get through this until a vaccine is uh, fully implemented and, and safely distributed. Dr. Levine. That was a great public health message. I can't add too much more to it, but um, I don't regard a teenager any differently than I do a young child or an adult. Um, it's six foot spaces not going in crowds, keeping masks on your face. And I guess the special message around holidays for teenagers uh, would be that you are much more likely to not know you actually are ill. Or even if you're not ill, you're much more unlikely to know that you were in a circumstance where you might have acquired the virus and be in an infectious period. And since around holidays, you're around not only parents, but often grandparents, people from generations that make them more susceptible just because of their age or other illnesses, just take extra care to uh, follow all of this guidance in those circumstances as well uh, to protect the, lo the ones you love. Thank you. Um, I have a second question. Oh, and wow. Dr. 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 Bell, Dr. Bell, would love to bring yeah. some pediatric yeah. insight into yeah. that as well. Right up your alley. <laughs> well, thanks so much for asking that question. Um, I do want to reiterate the importance of a flu vaccine, um, and we know that young people um, don't uh, have have a lower rate, um, usually in the thirty percent or so um, in your age group. So, encouraging others to get the flu vaccine now is the time to get it if you haven't. And I also just want to point out to folks that. Adolescents are actually really much better than adults at having some challenging conversations. Um, so Secretary French talked about the, having the COVID conversation. 
And I, I actually think young people are gonna be better at doing things like that than our adults. I mean, they are more adept at having conversations around consent. And so I think, I think talking about that, talking about expectations is you can model that for adults because you are very good at that. Um, and I also just wanna put the message out there that we know how important school is, we know how important sports are, and your community cares about you, and all of us in the community are, um, are working hard to keep community levels um, low so that you can keep going to school. So thanks. Thank you. Um, my second question might just be for you as well, Dr. Bell. Um, earlier you said students are doing better emotionally now that schools are back open. Um, with the possibility of shutdowns, are there any plans in place to ensure mental well-being for Vermont high schoolers should schools be forced to close again? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'd have to defer to someone else about a statewide response. I do just want to remind folks that your pediatricians um, are here for you, and a lot of the questions that they're fielding right now are about mental health. Um, and so remembering that um, pediatrics, um, pediatric care is about mental health too, please um, please talk to your pediatricians. Um, and I, I do, I hear you. Um, so many students tell me that even with two days back with hybrid, that those two days they feel a difference in their mental health on those days. There's structure, there's routine, they can connect with their friends, they can connect with adults. Um, so uh, we're really working hard to prevent closure, um, but I hear you that we would need more mental health support if that were to happen. I'll, I'll see if that, maybe Dr. Levine has something to add to that. The only addition to that would be that I think it was a misconception back in the spring when uh, things were truly shut down and schools were clearly closed uh, that accessing mental health support and resources was as impossible as everything else in life might have seemed at those times. But the reality is the mental health system was up and functioning. You know, and in Vermont, even though we often have concerns about adequacy of mental health providers and supports, we rank at the top of the list in the country when it comes to the opportunities Vermonters have to access those things. Uh, and we actually do a really good job here. So I would just keep that in mind. And back in the spring, telepsychiatry, telecounseling, telehealth, we're all very much operating uh, all the time and didn't go away. And even now, many of those people who are involved in those fields are continuing to offer the services remotely uh, in case their patients are concerned about the challenges of more face-to-face -face contact. So clearly do not uh, assume that those services are not available because school is closed, et cetera, et cetera. There will be a robust system in place to help provide that. Thank you. All right, Jolie, Local 22. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Great. Um, my question is, uh, considering New Hampshire's numbers, do we know roughly what might have caused this increase in cases? And um, either way, Governor Scott or Dr. Levine, um, has New Hampshire's governor um, discussed some of the um, Vermont's mitigation strategies or vice versa? Have we offered any of our mitigation strategies to help them? Um, I'll speak from the gubernatorial uh, level first and then Dr. Levine can talk about his, um, his uh, folks on, in the health uh, department side, health commissioners. Um, I speak with uh, Governor Sununu regularly. Um, he, uh, I know that they were very concerned uh, about what they perceived as a, a problem with their rinks and hockey and so forth. Uh, so they put a two week pause on, on hockey in, in New Hampshire. I don't know, I mean, it takes a while uh, to see if those measures uh, had any effect, uh, but that may be part of what they're seeing, uh, but, uh, but they're, coming to, they're trying to get to grips, uh, come to grips with this as well. Uh, this isn't easy, um, again, uh, we're concerned here because we share a border and, uh, and there's a lot of trade that goes back and forth. So uh, we'll continue uh, to do what we can and listen uh, to their perspective and what they're, what they're learning uh, so that we don't uh, make the same mistakes. Commissioner Levine. 
much, much like at the gubernatorial level and at the state health official level, there's also robust connections between the state epidemiologists. And I know that Dr. Kelso and Dr. Chan, uh, either via phone or via email, are also constantly connected and uh, addressing the fundamental problems that we have in combating a pandemic. Uh, I do know that New Hampshire has been more recently concerned about travel um, as perhaps part of the mix of what's <coughs> created their increase in numbers, but also judging by their very frequent uh, media releases to the public, they've been equally concerned about bars and restaurants. And um, they're wanting to cast as wide a net as possible when they relate cases to those kinds of establishments. I can tell you that in Vermont, um, we do not have large numbers of cases uh, that we can connect directly with having dined in a restaurant or been to a bar. So I just want that to be very clear. But I know that in New Hampshire, that has become an issue for them, and perhaps related to the, not the opening of them, but the pace of opening and the extent to which they've opened. Uh, but that's a hypothesis. Thank you. Avery, WCAX. Governor Scott, my question is about the hazard pay grant program. I know Commissioner Pichak is not on the line, but I just wanted to see if you speak to what the rationale was for employers applying rather than the employees. We too have been hearing from employer, employees from Walmart and Shaw's about how the companies were not applying. Yeah, I, th I think this was part of the legislation, uh, to be honest with you, Avery. Um, so. Um, that was how it was set up. Legislature decided uh, that this is the way they wanted to implement it. So that's what we've done. Um, wh what could you say to these people who may feel frustrated that they, they feel like they should be getting some sort of hazard pay and they worked during the, what was early on in the pandemic? What would you say to those people? Well, again, we're encouraging employers to come forward and uh, to sign up for the grant process and so that we can take care of, uh, disperse the money as best we can. Um, we have, uh, I think we went back in with another uh, request to the Joint Fiscal uh, Committee to, uh, to implement a second round of, uh, of hazard pay grants. So there's going to be another opportunity if they take us up on this, uh, which I'm not sure if they did or not. Uh, they didn't take uh, us up on all of the suggestions, but, uh, but they have, 10 days to do um, something with that. So we'll know more in the future if they didn't take us up uh, on on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, um, we'll know in the next week or so uh, whether we'll move forward on that. So there is, uh, there is going to be hopefully another opportunity to sign up for uh, this program. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. I have a question for Michael Harrington. Uh, popular today and I think the reason Michael is because we're getting a lot of questions on our side from uh, people who aren't working who have been getting uh, the various uh, as you had mentioned the, the various unemployment uh, benefits and the, the question I had is about the LWA and whether uh, the lost wages program has completely played out now if people could expect any more money or is it, or is it done uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I believe we have paid out roughly about 98% of that program um, based on the people who are eligible and the people who have, have certified for those weeks. Um, the program uh, has a future close date um, that FEMA will articulate to us and at that point we have 90 days following the close of the program before um, the funding uh, is is stopped. Um, from there, the only what we continually find, obviously, are either someone who has come in late and certified uh, in, through the program, um, and then we add them to the next pay file and they're paid, um, or if somebody has come through the appeals process um, and uh, was found eligible. Um, they, they too, uh, are able to certify and then be paid. I would say for the most part, this program has played out, um, you know, probably 90, 90% uh, of everybody who um, was counted and expected to be paid um, has been paid. There's no backlog 
Um, so it really is as people um, come through now and are either certifying um, at this point in time as opposed to when the program first launched or, or they're being made eligible. Um, so most of those funds uh, have gone out the door to individuals. If, if, if someone feels like they've fallen through the cracks, can they still come to your office and um, have some sort of adjudication? So they do have uh, appeal rights. That, that first of all, let me back up. If someone has not certified, uh, feels like they thought they had certified and, and should have received the benefit and they didn't, um, they can call our claim and assistance center. Uh, and the folks on the other end of the line have been trained to either take the certification over the phone. Um, what we did find was that we had a number of people who certified and actually responded no, that their separation was not COVID related. Um, and for whatever reason, uh, want to change their answer. Either they didn't understand the question or didn't know what they were agreeing to um, and what the impact would be. So they're now coming in um, and wanting to change answers. And there is a, an opportunity for recertification as well. Um, and we'll review those very closely for eligibility purposes. Um, but they can also do that by calling our, our claim center as well. So um, if they feel like they've been missed or, or um, feel like they were deemed ineligible, at the same time, even if they go through the recertification process and we find that they're ineligible, they do have appeal rights. Um, and they, it's the same appeal process as uh, anyone in, in traditional UI or PUA would have uh, in terms appealing the decision. All right, great, thank you. Yes, sir. All right, uh, we have about 14 minutes and, and four people, so just keep that in mind. Guy Page, the Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Guy Page. Governor, uh, oh, Governor Baker, Governor Baker. Go ahead, Guy. Governor Baker, in Massachusetts on Monday, restricted home social gatherings to 10 and required a 9.30 p.m. curfew on public gatherings. Um, if you make these recommendations you discussed earlier in the mandate, does that include a curfew and police powers to levy fines as Governor Baker has done? Yeah, too early to tell at this point in time, Guy. As you recall, we gave flexibility to municipalities to implement curfews if they thought it was necessary. Burlington had their curfew uh, for a while, but they've uh, since rescinded that. Uh, but that is still in place. Uh, they can still, communities can, uh, can uh, utilize this uh, tool if they see it's necessary uh, for, their, for their communities. But, um, but again, um, we're, you know, everything's on the table, but at this point, uh, that's not something I would rather not mandate this. This is an advisory at this point. Uh, we want everyone to be aware of their surroundings, aware of who they're having in their homes, and limit their gathering size. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an advisory. It's not a mandate. Right. Okay. Uh, also be interested in your thoughts on the Democratic progressive loss of their supermajority veto override, uh, which, uh, you know, what, what might have caused that? Uh, how it might affect legislation going forward, for example, the uh, bill about legalization of prostitution. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really, really close at this point. Uh, I don't think it's changed dramatically. Uh, there isn't a clear, um, clear number of, of Republicans who will be able to sustain a veto. So you're still counting on on uh, common sense uh, Democrats and independents alike uh, for there to be any ability to sustain or, you know, in terms of override, uh, same, uh, it, it's the same thing. The independents uh, and progressives are going to play a part in that as well. Thank you. Andrea, seven days. Andrea? Hi there. Can you hear me? We can. Hey, great. Um, so um, I'm wondering, since the 
specifically about um, uh, some, I have a question about kind of testing strategy as we go um, into this kind of winter holiday season, um, possibly, you know, slightly increased travel season. Um, I know the some of the high volumes of testing that we're seeing um, are sort of connected with the monitoring strategy when college campuses. Um, but as kind of as we head into the season where people may be maybe kind of traveling out of state and then coming back, um, are are there going to be any changes in kind of the state's approach to testing for the general public? Um, and uh, especially in that kind of uh, that week after after any holiday, I'm just wondering if there's kind of any anticipation that there's going to be kind of a lot of demand for testing. Yeah, we're going to continue to try and enhance our testing capacity as best we can. We're going to rely on, on private entities uh, to help us out with that. And we're also looking to uh, implement more of a surveillance uh, testing program as well. I'll let uh, Secretary uh, Smith answer that as well. Thank you for the question. A couple, maybe a week ago, I alluded to uh, some changes in our testing strategy. As you know, um, we went from fairly, back in March, having minimal uh, testing capacity to uh, pretty robust testing capacity, where we now, you know, anywhere from 25 to 30,000 tests a week, as, uh, and as you pointed out, many, a lot of that is in uh, the, uh, the student population in terms of a higher ed. One of the things that we did as we sort of went along and built that robust testing uh, uh, capacity was to sort of build upon success after success after success. But one thing we've done now is take a look at that testing strategy and wondering, does it work for Vermonters? And what you'll see um, in the upcoming weeks are a couple of things. One, uh, testing on demand that's at the convenience of the Vermonter and not basically uh, the provider. So that we'll see seven days a week testing opportunities. We'll see permanent locations throughout the state. It's gonna take us a while to build this capacity up, but I think you'll start seeing it roll out in the next uh, few weeks as we move forward. The next thing we're doing is much greater surveillance um, testing. Um, bigger populations in terms of what we're doing with surveillance testing. As you probably know, we're doing surveillance testing in our correctional facilities. We're doing uh, surveillance testing in long-term care facilities. We're doing surveillance testing in other areas as well. But we're gonna expand that now um, to fairly significant populations as we as we move forward. We're, de we're determining what those populations are now in order to get us the best look at what is happening in our state in terms of the progression or the, the regression of the virus. So um, I think in the next few weeks, next week or next two weeks, we'll have a, an announcement specifically of what this new testing strategy looks like. Um, and, and with that kind of um, that surveillance testing, um, would the population there be um, something like, like um, you know, associated with schools or, um, you know, or kind of a more general, like, regional population? I think what you said is possible. All things are considered, but if we were doing um, surveillance testing of uh, school staff and employees, for example, um, it wouldn't be just regional. We would probably do it system-wide as we look at it. Now, how that would be done, we would still be looking at it, but it's other populations as well, maybe public safety and some other populations as we're uh, as we're moving forward. Um, great, thank you. Andrew, Cal oh, Dr. Levine has one more question. I just wanted to add to the other part of the question that was asked. In my comments, I did make the point that for people attending gatherings at the holidays, we have recommended uh, testing a week later 
after those gatherings. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, this is for Dr. Levine. Um, just over three weeks ago, there were only 51 positive cases in the Northeast Kingdom. And since that time, we've added 63. And at least five different schools in the region have had cases. Um, I know at a recent conference, it was shown that the uh, Kingdom counties weren't connected with the ice sports outbreak. So what do you think is driving these cases? Is there a common thread, or are they just bubbling up through community transmission? Yeah, these are great questions. So we have continued to look for common threads um, and are not finding them. Um, so there is community transmission. We have also found that in Essex County, uh, on the New Hampshire border, there's some sharing of uh, educational programs and schools. Um, and there has been more activity on the New Hampshire border that seems to have um, affected those who are Vermont citizens, or residents, I should say. The other part, though, is a good illustration that being rural does not mean the virus won't find you. And that's what the nation has found uh, in the most recent months. You know, as we know, the New we don't hear about New York City or San Francisco or Chicago so much anymore. When the South and the Midwest had their surge over the summer, it was uh, quite notable that it was more suburban and rural and not necessarily urban. And we're seeing that progression continue now. So being rural is not protective is my, uh, my major message on that. better question for their states. Um, we didn't prevent uh, anyone from uh, witnessing our our uh, polling places, so I don't, uh, well, I don't that's know. Well, that's a great thing about Vermont. I mean, you know, we're pretty much polite and on the up and up up here, but it's not always so in some of the major cities I've found. All right, Steve, we only uh, have a anyway, couple minutes if uh, you had a question for Dr. Levine. For the doctor. Um, uh, the doctor, as you know, there was a moratorium. I, I wonder why we're so incurious about the origin of this, uh, about the origin of this pandemic. And as you know, there was a moratorium on this research uh, regarding coronaviruses and other uh, pathogens, nasty pathogens, from um, October of 2014 to December of 2017. And um, the uh, there were over 200 scientists and, and bioethicists who had signed petitions to to keep this research because it, it it they said it risked an outbreak and a global pandemic, and, and this was a couple years ago. Um, I mean, do you support gain of function or almost the weaponization of these viruses? Wasn't something like this bound to happen? So. Without referring to the terms weaponization or gain of function, uh, every scientist and every infectious disease specialist believes something like this was bound to happen, but through more natural occurrence and through the fact that the bat family seems to be a natural reservoir for many of these viruses and that there have been other examples of other species of animals um, 
allowing the virus to be transmitted from them to the human population, so-called zoonosis. So uh, this, this pandemic was inevitable. Everyone will agree with that. Um, the real issue has to be um, further research on the topic of zoonoses and the topic of viruses and their uh, genetic makeup and how they um, can cleverly um, exist in different species of animals and humans, um, to put it that way. So that's what's going to be continuing. I have no doubt that there'll be ongoing research as there was previously. The other thing your question brings to light, and just sort of closing here on a high note, is the fact that um, public health has known this all along, and public health has known that sufficient emergency preparedness and pandemic preparedness is a core function and needs to be well supported, even when times look good. So the fact is the country and the world are, re are all recognizing that once again. And I suspect that uh, if lessons are learned, preparedness for the next time around, which hopefully won't be as quick as people are thinking and could be another 100 years, uh, preparedness will be much better at that time. Yeah, but humans have, humans have shared caves with bats uh, since time immemorial. And, uh, and especially when we have people who've escaped from communist China saying that they can identify the cut marks um, on, on the genome. Uh, I, I, do you think that we should look into that? No, I think, I think what we're recognizing is the conditions of the planet and the conditions of humans encroaching on environments that they haven't encroached on as, to as a greater degree previously and bringing all of these things much more in concert with one another, more connectedness. That's sort of how it's evolved. Uh, I, I'm giving a short shrift to that part of the answer because I know it's one o'clock and uh, that would take a much lengthier dissertation. All right, great. Well, thank, thank you both very much. Thank you all very much. Uh, we'll see you on Tuesday to talk about our travel modeling.